Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 116 of Sports Speak. Hope you're doing well. We're back from a couple of week layoff. I'm Eddie Kalecki. And I'm Tim Moore. Joined by Drew Jua today. We're going to talk some NASCAR, also NFL, Sports Speak Fantasy, and maybe some college football as well. Let's start with the NFL, though, because, of course, as an Eagles fan, I have to address the elephant in the room, and that was an embarrassing Monday Night Football loss to the Washington Commanders. Now, they played bad in that game, and what was really frustrating was that it was the veteran players that made the biggest mistakes. Quez Watkins, I don't understand how he fumbled that ball on the 60-yard catch. Just stay down on that play. You already got 60 yards. He gets up, he's holding the ball up by his head, and then a Washington secondary player just comes and knocks it out of his hands. And then the play that ended up sealing the game with Brandon Graham hitting Taylor Heineke like three seconds after he took a knee, that, that was not good either. But I still have faith in the Eagles, you know, I still have faith in the Eagles because there are some people that were drawing comparisons between them and the 2020 Steelers. I don't think the Eagles are going to go on that sort of a collapse. I will say, though, there's not a lot of easy games for Philly in the second half of the season. They still have to play the Giants twice. They still have to play Dallas once. They have Green Bay and Tennessee and Chicago and Indianapolis. And the Eagles' big problem right now is that they can't stop the run with Jordan Davis hurt and Fletcher Hawk. Fletcher Cox getting old. Nadama Kung Su is actually now on the Eagles. He, he just signed a contract with them a couple of minutes ago, but I still have concerns about them stopping the run when they have to play Jonathan Taylor and Derrick Henry and Justin Fields in the next few weeks. So some concerns about the Eagles, but overall they're still eight and one and they're still in first place. And Tim, the NFC East has just been so impressive this year and even Washington getting in on it. Yeah. I mean, it, we were just talking about this before we went live here on the show. And it's the fact of the matter that, listen, as much as a lot of people have laughed about the Washington commanders going into this year, you cannot deny that this team is a better football team with Taylor Heineke under center and their record really does show the kind of team they are. They are five and five. They're at 500. And listen, I know for years we've talked about, Oh, you know, the defense is the highlight for Washington. You know, that that's their main focus. You've got to get through that to win games games against the commanders and they've never really ever lived up the par except for one season and honestly I feel like their defense this season has done a good job keeping them games of course they didn't have I, I don't think right Chase Young's out for a while if I'm not mistaken right after after his recent injury I, I could so. be yeah it's more of you look at that. That's one of your main guys, one of your main pass rushers. You find success without him. They mix around that team. And the big thing is this is that despite all uh, of what's going on in Washington with everything falling apart. The fact that this team in the big picture could potentially be a wild card team to me is absolutely mind blowing because again, I know we've talked about just like, for example, you know, uh, uh, in other franchises, the Philadelphia Phillies, I'll give an example, of course, makes the world series this year. You know, you fire your manager, your team looks like it's in disarray and all of a sudden you're, in a championship uh, championship opportunity playing in the World Series, it, it's stunning. And I'm not saying that's going to happen to the commanders by any means, but this week they turn around, they have a very winnable game against the Texans. We could be looking at the commanders potentially being only two and a half, three games out of a, a, of a wild card spot. All they have to do is continue to play good football, and there's a chance. Again, they have two games against the Giants. That can go 50-50. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more division games that, as we know, just because you may be a good team, just as the Eagles pro uh, proven this past week, he, division play is unpredictable. Any team can win on any given Sunday. And that really falls for any team in the league. But in division play, it just proves it's ultimately unpredictable. But the, the fact of the matter is, if you would have told me 11 weeks into the season that every single team in the NFC East would have been above 500, I probably would have called you nuts. Because believe me, yes, did I believe the Giants are going to go 11-6 this year? 100%. Did I believe the Eagles and the Cowboys were, were going to be above 500? Of course, I predicted Dallas to win the division and not Philadelphia. Um, and I felt Philadelphia was a good team, just, again, needed to prove itself. But I definitely didn't expect what we're seeing from Washington to this point. And it's definitely been impressive. But honestly, I, I, again, though, you mentioned Philadelphia, and this is the last point I'll make. You mentioned Philadelphia getting into the tough part of their schedule. The same thing really is going to be coming for the Giants. They still have to play Minnesota. Of course, you have one more game against the Cowboys on Thanksgiving, which that could go 50-50. And you've got two against Philadelphia, two against Washington, and so on. This team can 
you know, play productive football, but he can also really miss the playoffs relatively quickly. Seattle's playing very good football. San Francisco's playing very good football. And if Washington against weaker opponents as the schedule goes on, plays good football, there's a team we could be looking at in the NFC East that could be the odd man out. And I, I just do it like this. It's going to create a very interesting scenario come the end of December. But my God, I'm loving this season. Not, I don't know if it's the odds, or the, the oddity of the fact that we're so used to these powerhouse teams, you know, with, with good quarterbacks, such as Tampa Bay, Green Bay every year, knowing that they're going to be the top teams in the NFL and not seeing that this year. I mean, for example, who would have expected every team in the opposite side of the AFC East in the playoff picture this far into the season? I, I don't think a person could have expected it. Yeah, it's been so unpredictable, but I was looking at where the postseason grid is right now. You actually sort of undersold about how close the commanders actually are to a playoff spot. They're only a half game out of a wild card spot right now. Is Uh, it really only a half game in Seattle? Yeah. 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 My goodness. That was two and a half. Okay. Yeah. So this right now, as I look at the playoff picture, Washington, I think, is going to be very dependent. They have a couple of very easy games coming up. They play the Texans, then they play Drew's Falcons, who we'll get to in a minute. But um the, the what's going to be dependent on when Carson Wentz is healthy, what they do, because I truthfully believe Taylor Heineke is the quarterback. They can have a chance to make the playoffs. Carson Wentz is the quarterback. They don't have a chance to make the playoffs. So, but I look at the picture right now. And realistically, I think the seven teams that they are in the NFC postseason right now are going to end up being the seven. As much as the schedule gets more difficult for the Giants and the Eagles, I really don't see a world at this point with how good they've been that the Giants, Eagles, and Cowboys don't all make the playoffs. The Niners have the best roster in the NFC now with the addition of Christian McCaffrey. If he stays healthy, they're probably going to win the West. And Geno Smith has been amazing. And the Seahawks have built up a nice little gap to start the year. Tom Brady post-divorce is 2-0. and The rest of the South is terrible. They're going to win the division. And Kirk Cousins and the Vikings are somehow 8-1. and So I think those are going to be the seven teams. My worry for the NFC East is that I also see a very realistic path where none of the NFC East teams make it to the NFC championship game because the way it's structured right now, let's just say for argument's sake, the Eagles, Giants, and Cowboys all continue on the same trend and the Eagles win the division and get the one seed and the Vikings get the two seed and nothing really that much drastic changes. If the Eagles get the one seed and they get that bye, that would likely mean that the Giants would be playing against Tampa Bay. And I think a game like that would be very similar to how the Commanders played against Tampa Bay two years ago in the playoffs with Heineke. I think it would be a close, low-scoring game, but a team with not the best offense is Tom Brady's best friend right now. And I think the Bucs could win that. I think the Giants would be happy to make the playoffs in the first year of this developmental stage, but the Bucs would get past the Giants. The Cowboys, in my theory, if the Niners win the division, They'd have a rematch against San Francisco, and I can see Dallas absolutely hilariously losing some playoff game. And then if they're out, then you've got the Eagles facing the Bucs in the second round. And like I said, you can't bet against Tom Brady, especially post-divorce. So it's very realistic if Tom Brady lives up to Tom Brady standards and Christian McCaffrey doesn't get hurt, that all three NFC East teams, as great as the division has been, don't even make it to the conference championship. But I just wanted to put that out there. But since we have Drew here, Let's talk about the NFC South and the Atlanta Falcons and Marcus Mariota, who uh, has been interesting. Do you want to see uh, the quarterback uh, switch, or are you still a Mariota man? Or I don't even know anymore. Like I, I watch these games and they look this, they look different every single game. Like we have a good rushing offense one game, and then that Thursday night football game was not good. I know there was the aspect of the rain, but they were struggling all game. Like. I, I don't I don't know, man. It, uh, the Falcons just been so poor all season. We shouldn't have we 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 had a chance to win almost every single game. Not not that one. That was that was not good. Uh, Marcus Marriott, I, who is our backup? Do you know? I was just about that. Who even is the backup on the Atlanta Falcons? It's, like, the, it's the Cincinnati quarterback from last year. I completely forgot his name. Okay, like again, like that does justice in any regards. I just, I, I can't believe Atlanta didn't take a quarterback in the draft. That still stuns me. Oh, they, they have Desmond Ritter as their Desmond backup. Ritter. Desmond oh, Ritter. Ritter. Yeah, they did wow. take him. Desmond Ritter. Wow. I'll, I'll be honest though. Uh, I'll be honest though. Know. Based on what we saw from Desmond Ritter last year, he seems like one of those unsung guys that can kind of slide in and do a pretty good job. 
I could see Desmond Ritter being a better quarterback than Malik Willis or Kenny Pickett. I could honestly, see that happening. honestly, what I would like the Falcons to do is try and do like a Patriots experimental where they go back and forth with uh, those two quarterbacks. Um, because I feel like Marcus Mariota is starting to hit his limits, kind of like trying starting to regress. And I mean, he, he's done his job as a Falcons quarterback this season, but it's not the future. It really isn't. I would well, like to see Desmond Ritter get a chance. Well, well, I do want to say this. I don't think the expectations for Marcus Mariota were quite high, to be honest. And I will say the Falcons, in my opinion, although we really do talk about this every season, they've outperformed expectations, but also at the same time, didn't reach their expectations. And the reason why I say this, the Falcons, there's a lot of games this year. And, and really, it's been the same case the last two years, where if you look back at the schedule, you're like, wow. This team could have made the playoffs if they just played good for, you know, another five more minutes in the game or maybe didn't make that, you know, big turnover or, you know, fall apart in a big moment, blow a big lead. Ever hear that one before? You know, the, the big thing for Atlanta is they're still in an opportunity, which, again, very slim. It's Tom Brady, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers finally find to find their stride. But you're in an opportunity to still win the NFC South. Of course, a wild card, let's be honest, unrealistic for Atlanta. But this team, all it needs to do is just find a little pep in its step and a little bit of mo uh, you know motivation. But the fact of the matter is, I, while I feel like Marcus Mariota hasn't performed, he's not a starting quarterback worthy of playing in the NFL, in my opinion, but he's there because he's there. I feel like he's actually outperformed expectations because if I'm being honest, if going into the season, I would have said, eh, with Marcus Mariota, this team's maybe winning two, three games this year, and they've already beyond done that. So I think for Orlando, the fact of the matter is you've got to find something. And let's not forget this. You know, they started the year, didn't have Kyle Pitts for a little bit after he, he started off pretty nicely. But what do the Falcons really have? Think about it. They, they lost Russell Gage to Tampa Bay. They traded away Calvin Ridley, but he wasn't going to play this year anyways. Who does who, who does the Falcons actually have to catch balls? It almost feels like the New York Giants situation. Just the Giants have a better quarterback, as crazy as that sounds, and a run game. I, I really can't think for Atlanta how, uh, as, as an offense, they can be constructive in any way possible, which is why Marcus Mariota being a quarterback, he was pretty much set up for failure, I feel, and that's why I think he's actually outperformed his expectations at this point in the season. Yeah, I, I think it's a fair point. It, it's it's a weird spot for them to be in. Also, I think it's becoming more and more evident that it was a horrible decision to drop Kyle Pitts as early as the Falcons did last year. He still got potential, but I don't know. Drafting a tight end that early when you have many more important issues to solve on your team probably wasn't the best strategy. But I want to shift to the AFC now, where Tim alluded to it a few minutes ago. We're talking all about the NFC East right now, all four AFC East teams would make the playoffs in the West. That was so touted coming into the year only be the chiefs. But I think we got to talk about the Buffalo bills because they've lost back-to-back -back games, both one possession games to the jets and the Vikings, both great games that came down to the very end. But I think it's fair to say that there's some concerns. And I know last year, the bills ran into some trouble around the midway stage of the season, they dropped a couple of games they shouldn't have, specifically the game against Urban Meyer and the Jaguars. But, you know, in its, in its year this year, where the AFC East is much more competitive, the Dolphins are great. Tua is playing borderline MVP level. The Jets have a really solid team. And New England is probably very comparable to their roster that they had last year and are probably going to finish around the same as they did last season. The East is difficult. And... The Bills have lured up back to back. There's concerns about Josh Allen's health with the elbow issue. And now you look at the next two weeks, and I feel like there are two potential trap games here because they play the Browns, and suddenly they're talking about how there could be six feet of snow. So that game could either be moved to a neutral site at Detroit, which throws off any sort of home field advantage the Bills would have, or it's going to be played in a massive snowstorm, which really levels the playing field. And then they do play the Lions on Thanksgiving Day and say what you want about the Lions, but they have back-to-back -back wins in division play. And you know they're going to be pumped up and get, Dan Campbell's going to have them pumped up to play on Thanksgiving with Are the Bills also coming up in a short week. Are they playing in Detroit? Yeah. Or is it, yes. So it is, again, Dan Campbell at home. I, I'm just, you can't underrate the Lions there at all. 
By the way, he got his first road win last week, something that nobody thought he'd ever be. The Lions to. hadn't won a road game in two years. That's kind of insane. But uh, Drew, at this point with the Bills, they've dropped back to back. They're now back somehow in third place in the AFC East. Do you have worries about them going forwards? Um, To make the playoffs, no. I think they're a solid pick uh, to make the playoffs. Um, I'm looking at the schedule here. They got a pretty tough schedule. They got a, about four or five uh, division games left, uh, two being the Patriots. Um, they also play the Bengals. So I feel like they're going to not have the easiest way out uh, to the playoffs. But how they looked earlier this season, they they were dominating games. And a lot of those games weren't really close. I know they, they had a close game against – um the Dolphins so my only concern is if uh Josh Allen stays healthy and uh the defense you know stays healthy I think they have a pretty easy way to the champion uh to the playoffs but um with how this season's been it's been so unpredictable you know these we thought um the pay uh the Packers were going to do good without uh (laughs) Devontae Adams but that's not the case so I'm not too sure. I think they do, but this season's been too unpredictable to tell. Yeah. Now, one other NFL topic I want to get to. The Colts beat the Raiders. We know the Raiders are a disaster. Devontae Adams leaving the Packers. It, 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 it's, it's hurt the Packers and the Raiders. But the Raiders lose to the Colts, and the Colts with Jeff Saturday as the interim head coach. And this has become one of the bigger debates in the NFL over the past week or so. Some people – in the media are really excited about Jeff Saturday getting this opportunity. And personally, I side with them because I think this is cool to let someone with a unique perspective come in. And there are others who say that this is a disgrace to the coaching profession because he has no experience. I want to let both of you sound off, but let me just give my two cents here. I feel like when you fire a coach mid season and you just have one of his coordinators step up and become the head coach, it's accomplishing nothing because it's the same system. It's probably a person that that head coach, that outgoing head coach hired. So he was working for that head coach. So what is he really going to change? Maybe he'll take advantage of the opportunity being a head coach now having this new role and try to switch things up. Maybe he didn't see eye to eye with the head coach, but it's much more likely that you'll find success by bringing in someone new. And if you're going to make the argument, well, maybe the Colts just want to tank. Well, if the Colts want to tank and continue to play badly, then why wouldn't they keep the bad coach and Frank Reich on the staff for the rest of the season? So I think this is a smart move. I think this is a popular move that Jim Irsay made. And at this point, they're one and oh, I'm not, I don't, and the expectations are so low for Jeff Saturday that anything good is going to seem great. So Tim, I'll go to you first. What are your thoughts on this Jeff Saturday move? I love every single bit of this move. And I'll first start with how Jeff Saturday addressed the media. Listen, he made it very, very clear. Does he have coaching experience? No. But he also made it very clear. Listen, he's played in the NFL for 14 years. He's played in two Super Bowls. And my man has played with, I think it was five, six Hall of Famers throughout his career. And his statement was simply this. He knows what success looks like. Just because he doesn't have any coaching experience doesn't mean he knows what it's like to put a locker room together or feel what it's like to be a player. And and honest to God, really reminds me of someone else that currently coaches the NFL that we were just talking about a moment ago. Reminds me a lot of Dan Campbell. Really think about it. Because if you ever, if anyone that's watched Hard Knocks this past year, Of course, Dan Campbell has coaching experience, but where Dan Campbell connects is that he builds an entire locker room and a coaching staff that, for the most part, have playing experience and are former players so that they have that connection with the players to not just be themselves, but understand that direction of where those players are coming from. Dan Campbell was one of those guys. For Jeff Saturday, it's the same exact set. He's seen a lot of success. Listen, my man was the center for Peyton Manning. There's no better coach you can learn from, in my opinion, than Peyton Manning being that guy right behind you telling you directions. 
I'm excited for this. I really am. And like you said, anything positive for Indianapolis at this point is huge. But listen, I, I know some people in the coaching profession may be a little bit uh, feel a little bit disrespected because I get it. There's a lot of people that work hard, put in effortless hours, especially as assistants, to just try to get that opportunity. And honestly, Eddie, I think to, to that point of why you see that direction more often than not, not just to keep the team, you know, intact of a familiar system moving forward, but it's the fact of the respect to those coaches and the coaching staff that, listen, we understand you're putting in all these hours and thus the opportunity should come from there. But I think it breaks the barrier in regards to the fact that, listen, I think there should be coaches in the NFL that have a good, deep understanding of the game that may not have coaching experience or for example let's look at the basketball end for for a moment right you have coaches in the nba that may have never played the game itself but are good at coaching and there are people like that i mean they, think about it i mean realistically think about greg popovich greg popovich never played the game but pop's a really good draw up guy and knows a lot of basketball because he fell in love with it it could be the same exact way, you know, in the NFL. And I get, I understand the idea of, you know, former players become coaches and so on. And he does fall under that scenario. But the idea is the fact that he doesn't need to be a coach to do it. And I'm loving, like I said, every single bit of this. And listen, I know the Colts aren't going to go out and win every single game. That team on paper is not built to win games, let's be honest. But if this turns out to be a success and you see a big change in a positive way for Indianapolis, I want Jeff Saturday back next year. And it's that simple because I think the NFL is an opportunity to break barriers, just like how bringing in female assistant coaches to try to break females into the NFL to become a head coach. I think it should be the same exact way for, you know, players that have a very good legacy and are going to impact as individuals that may not have coaching experience to try to get their hand in the NFL. Um, and I think this is a good first step. And it's definitely exciting to see what Jeff Saturday can bring because he's a very good personality. Drew, how about you? Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna short it. I feel like the same way as Tim. I feel like uh any win and any W in the column is a step in the right direction. I feel like if they continue, I why go away from him? I mean, they're they're if they put in the wins and they even have a chance to make the playoffs, which I know is a pretty slim margin with how good the uh, AFC East teams are doing, but if that's a possibility, why would you move away from him? He's those wins our wins at the end of the day. I mean, I know he made a questionable move with Matt Ryan coming back. And honestly, Matt Ryan looked like a good quarterback that game. And Jonathan Taylor actually came to life and, you know, break, broke his like 3.4 average per game. So um, I think it's a good move. Um, if they fall down the same path, then that's when I think you have to start questioning it. But um, I think it's a good move to for the end of the season. So oh, one quick thing in the NFL, we got about 10 minutes left in the show. Uh, Sports speak fantasy football league standings. Well, I've tumbled a bit because I've had two uh, pretty oh, rough, goodness. close losses in a row to big teams in the East, to Zoe and to Tim. Tim is now in first place in the East at eight and two. Zoe now has the tiebreaker over me. So she would be the two seed from the East at seven and three. Poach and Franks are tanking, basically. And, and, and you and I are going for the one seed this week. Whoever wins takes it. So yes. you got to Yes. And then Raheel's at nine and one, uh, eight and two for Mr. Bellows. And then I see the best ginger. Now you've beaten both of the other gingers this season. So at least I know, I know you, know, you I own that fun. title, but you're four and six. So what's okay. I was, I was like, Tim said, I have a really easy path to maybe make the playoffs. Yeah. And, and, then then to, well, and then I lose to, and then I lose to Pocha. Then I lose to Pocha. Poach, oh. Poach has one had one win going in the last yeah, week. Bro, outside of outside of Joshua Franks, he had the worst points put up in the league, and Drew found him in the worst week possible. Dude, the my, worst week possible. Well, I'm looking at my team now, and I'm averaging 86.9. I'm like, how is that possible? And I put Kyler Murray back in because he projected. Now he's not. So it's like my team has been injury like so many injuries this whole season. It's frustrating <laughs> say the same thing with miniker i'll tell you what miniker is like of the one win teams you know poach hasn't exactly been the most active if i'm being quite transparent but for example miniker i think has one or maybe he just got a second one last week i don't remember but i mean my man has been trying his hardest 
trying his absolute hardest to better his team because literally almost everyone in that roster has either not played well uh, in terms of living up to fantasy expectations or has gotten hurt. I mean, I just traded him Kittle and Kittle had a horrible week last week. And I feel bad because he gave me fr- uh, Firemouth, which I think we've been the only trade this season. And it's just like, man, I just gave you an upgraded tight end to try to help you out. And instantly, it's not panning out for you. Well, wow. I have a lesson to teach here. This is why you do not draft players because they play for your favorite team. If, well, you, look at my, if you look at my fantasy teams, I don't have that many Eagles aside from Dallas Goddard. And I think I have like A.J. Brown on like one team. Miniker took a lot of Broncos and took a big risk with Broncos country. Let's ride. He's got Sutton. He's got Judy and he's got Russell Wilson. Now he's got Mahomes because remember we did the weird like gimmick draft. So Mahomes was able to slip to like the 10th round to at first be his backup quarterback. And then, I mean, when you look at his roster, it's really not that bad. So I, I think he's got a chance to maybe steal a couple more wins. He plays Bellows this week, so he's not winning that one. He- See, where I've gotten bailed out this season, I will say, is that I had a lot of my injuries early in the season, which means, of course, based on rules for those that don't know, the only way we're allowed to pick up transactions in the league is rather if we have a player on a bye week or if we have a player get injured and we can physically in the franchise, uh, the franchise, goodness, this isn't Madden, uh, but in the, in, the, in the league, put them into an IR slot. So needless to say, I had two players in the first week go on IR. Well, guess what? I was able to, you know, add a little bit of depth in those positions. I ended up getting Curtis Samuel, which was a massive, massive surprise because I didn't expect the success he had. And, uh, oh goodness, I think I had Jamal Williams as well uh, in the running back spot that I was able to end up picking up. And he's been with me, you know, all the way around. And of course, I think I have Alvin Kamara and, you know, a whole bunch, a whole bunch of variety of players now. And it's like, I'm, I'm, in terms of depth, I have so many options on the bench and it's like in the running back spot because I really like to load the running backs um, as much as I can get them. But it's like I have too many options now, but now I have nobody hurt, so I can't cut them either. So I'm just like looking for Bobby. For example, Debo got went on the IR last week for me briefly. I was able to get him back, but it's like, oh man, who, who do I replace? Who do I let go? I can't figure it out. So it, it's been chaotic, but it's definitely been a lot of fun this season. And I look forward to the next draft in terms of uh, the crazy gimmicks we'll have because i definitely am coming up with more ideas as the year goes on let's shift to nascar now we're all here so let's congratulate the king of 2022 tim moore now of course disclaimer drew was not here for race one he joined about five weeks in so six 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 and i led for the first 30 weeks in the standings and how dominant i was to start the year the first 10 races despite all the next gen malfunctions my worst finish for a driver was 12th And then I just fell apart after that. And then Tim slowly came back. And then in the playoffs, I had some disastrous choices. Hey, that's not the... That's not the only person I've ever heard of collapsing after about 80% of the way through the season. Yeah, I know, I know. know. Frank Frank the Tank would understand exactly what I'm talking about. So... I'm thinking more of the Mets, but yeah, you know, it's... Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, Frank, oh, my goodness. I I took that a little bit slow. My bad. I thought you were going to say 80% way through the game, and I was about to say, um, I don't know what you're talking about. So... So... But someone who did not collapse is Joey Logano. And now he's building quite the resume. He's a two-time champion. He's only he's somehow only 32 years old. He's going to be starting his 16th full-time Cup Series season in 2023. He's won a Daytona 500. Drew, what does this championship mean for his legacy? And how far up the NASCAR ranks do you think he's on a path to right now at this point in his career? It just depends. Like, this season with the next gen has been so... Just so everywhere. I mean, we saw... The Ross Chastain move, we saw beef throughout the season. Um, I think it's definitely boosted him up. I mean, he's he's nearing Kyle Busch standards. I know Kyle Busch has the most wins uh, out of all three series combined. But, you know, you look at these two-time champions, and he's he's up there. I mean, he's been in the league for 16 years now. That um, And I don't, I don't know. I think, I think he's definitely Hall of Fame worthy. There's no doubt in my mind he's – He's been that solid person for Roger Penske for the last, what, 10 years now. And he, with the, without a doubt in my mind, he is a Hall of Fame uh, driver. But it's going to be interesting to see Candy defend his title. I know it's been pretty hard since Jimmy Johnson to uh, defend, his ti- defend a title. Um, so 
with this next gen, it's just going to be about what team figures out uh, the right things to do at every single uh, aspect of every single track. And um, can you, you know, get through that? Yeah. I say what the craziest part is, Eddie, is think about this. Joey Logano is still young. Mm-hmm. Like, he has years left. I mean, he's not young by any means. Of course, he's been here forever now, but... Joby Logano still has, in my opinion, at least eight, ten more years of good racing left in his career, which is just so crazy to think about. But again, I remember as a kid, maybe you may not because you're a little bit younger than me, but I will never forget the short track commercial of like when NASCAR first started advertising home tracks before Joby Logano was even a part of Gibbs in terms of Xfinity and so on coming through the ranks. I remember seeing commercial of, you know, young Joby Logano, uh, you know, Connecticut native you know turning around dominating all these short tracks and they put him into a commercial and then you know it turns out a year later he gets signed by Gibbs it's like wow I saw that kid grow up and come through the ranks of course he's older than me but the point is is that you know it's like I saw that guy when I was a little kid and it's crazy to think because it, it, it and now I'm 24 years old that was maybe 17 years ago right so you think about it like that I was like seven eight years old this guy is still in his 30s has a lot of years to go. I mean, it's just crazy to think about. And again, I, a lot of respect to him winning a championship this year. It's cool for Roger Penske. I know it's unfortunate for uh, on the Gibbs end of, you know, how badly they wanted to see Bell get it because of what happened. But I just want to say too, I really appreciate how Logano and, and all of Team Penske as well um, handled that with all class. And they really, you know, Logano, really handled the situation winning a championship like a true champion rather you like Logano or not over the years you can't say he didn't act like he hasn't been there before and he honestly really looked like a true champion after after Phoenix yeah for sure uh so the NASCAR season is complete about a minute left in the show let's finish with this Drew University of Georgia probably the best football team right now they just beat Tennessee I'm optimistic that a Big Ten team can match up with them, but the SEC always reigns supreme, it seems like. Uh, at this point, you got the Bulldogs as the uh, championship favorites in college football? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, I think the only team that, you know, will rival us and I think we'll see in the uh, the championship game is uh, Ohio State. That's – I don't think we've ever matched up with Ohio State in these playoffs besides – yeah, but yeah, I think um, that's going to be an interesting game to see. So I, I think we got it locked up, but, you know, this game, this everything's been so un- unpredictable this year. Yeah, it's been kind of wild. TCU trying to sneak into a playoff spot. Big Ten trying to see if they can get two teams in for the second year in a row. And then, of course, the SEC has been very exciting, too, with Georgia, Alabama losing two games. Alabama, so what happened? <laughs> what happened, Alabama? We need to get James Draw. We need to get James Draws on Sports Speak. That that's got to be a yeah. goal for the future. But uh, that's going to wrap up this episode. If we don't post again before Thanksgiving, we wish you and your family a happy Thanksgiving. We've got a lot of fun sports going on. World Cup also gets started next week. We're going to talk a little bit about that on our next episode. So stay tuned for that. We appreciate Drew Jua and his cat for joining us here today on Sports Speak. But until next time, I'm Eddie Kalegi. and I'm Tim Moore. Signing off of Sportspeak, there's the cat right there. Have a great rest of your weekend.